Good morning and welcome and thank you very much for joining us uh, today for this session. Uh, my name is Rosemary uh, and I understand the title of this session is a quite complicated concept, past categorization. But in uh, subtext, women authors cannot be defined by their gender alone. So we have four exceptional panelists for our discussion this morning, and I'd like you to please welcome with me Leila Abu Leila, <laughs> Rupa Faruqi, Maha Khan Phillips, and Alexandra Pringle. Uh, three writers and a publisher. I think that's a great combination <laughs> and a good title for a film. Um, <laughs> I'll ask each of them in a minute to introduce themselves in the way that they would like to, and then I will share a few questions and ask them to respond, and then as we get through the session, we will open up to you, the audience, uh, so that you can ask the questions that, that you've got in your, in your head. Um, it's been my privilege to lead the British Council in Pakistan during the last two and a half years. And we are absolutely delighted to be supporting the Lahore Literary Festival. And I congratulate Razi and his colleagues uh, for taking LLF from strength to strength, not only here in Lahore, its home, but also in New York and London, and I think plans further across the world too. Just to say a little about myself, I was born and raised in a very small village in England um, on a small farm. So going to London to university was a very big step away from home for me. Uh, and my early career was as a physics teacher. Uh, and so that was then and, and still now to some extent uh, a very male dominated world of science and technology. But I'm delighted that there are some terrific uh, young women scientists in Pakistan and, and a growing number who are achieving great things. With my family, and I've got two children, uh, I've been lucky to travel and work widely, as both as a teacher and then working for British Council, from Khartoum, which I think uh, I'd share with, with Leila, to Moscow, from Dar es Salaam to Islamabad and across Europe. I I think that identity is important for each of us, uh, but it's our choice individually as to how we express that for ourselves. So perhaps I could begin with asking each of you, um, starting with you, Leila, to say a little bit more about yourself and if you are past categorization. Okay. Um, uh, Salam alaikum. Nice to see you this morning. Um, well, I, I grew up in, in Khartoum in, in Sudan, and I studied uh, statistics at the University of Khartoum. And, um, and then I got uh, married and, and had a baby, and then after that I moved to, to the UK, I moved to, to Scotland. And it was only then that I started to, to write, so I came into writing a bit late. I was in my um, you know, late 20s when I, when I started uh, to, to write, which is a little bit later than maybe some people nowadays, yeah. Um, I guess maybe the biggest challenge I, I faced was that I had, my mother was uh, the first uh, uh, demographer in Sudan. She was um, an academic and she reached uh, the position of being the dean of her college. And so I was brought up very much, even though the society around me was very conservative, it was taken for granted that I would also have a university career and that I would also, like my mother, um, teach in the university. <laughs> And uh, however, I didn't, I wasn't able to do that and I wasn't able to finish my PhD and then I kind of turned to, to writing and so I disappointed my mother and uh, a lot of other um, women around me and uh, I remember when I first started writing, my friends who were with me in university were like, you're just sitting at home, you know, what, what happened? You used to be the best in the class, you used to get higher grades than the boys. Why are you hiding away and, and writing at home? So it took a long time for me to, uh, to get over that and to kind of like uh, be able to, to show or to even feel within myself that what I was doing, the writing, um, 
was as much as a value as you know working in a in a kind of a male dominated uh, world but it was very much when i was young growing up it was very much hearing about oh women who were work out inside the house and women who sit at home you know in the kitchen that was kind of the divide and it was very clear that i was meant to be with the group that was out there and so it's um that that's kind of been my my as a woman that has been the thing that has kind of haunted me all these all these years yeah Th thank you. I mean, there are hundreds of questions that come out of just what you, you've shared with us. But perhaps if, if I can ask Rupa, you next. I, I think you were born here yes, I was. in Lahore. So perhaps you could tell us a bit more. Sure. Um, gosh, it's quite a loaded question, isn't it? Are we, are we past categorization? Um, I think we'd all like to think that we are quite kind of diverse and different and we are individuals with our own journeys and stories. Um, I guess mine started here. I was born in Lahore. Um, my mum was from Bangladesh, and uh, my dad was from here, from Lahore. And um, after my, my sisters were older, they started their education here, and eventually my family moved to the UK. So I was born in Lahore, raised in London. Um, I eventually went to, um, I went to Oxford, and I did, my, I did politics, philosophy, and economics there. But I always thought I was a writer, and even though in my family people become doctors and civil servants and lawyers, and accountants, I always thought I'd be a writer and I wanted to do something creative. So um, I actually didn't, I was always writing, but I didn't actually try and publish at first. So um, I worked in advertising. I wrote um, some of the most successful advertorials and um, <laughs> things for Saatchi and Saatchi. Um, my, um, some lines that I wrote may continue to haunt me, particularly one I wrote for um, a toilet cleaner, <laughs> which is probably still my most famous um, written line, I guess. And, um, and then I started to, think more seriously about my writing, what I really wanted to do. I was also trying to have a family at the same time. And um, I moved to France with my husband, and we tried to kind of start a different kind of life. So having been um, in Lahore, and then London, and then a politics um, undergrad, and then a worldwide account director in advertising. Um, I was briefly an accountant as well, but let's kind of shift over <laughs> that dark part of my past. I thought, okay, now let me, let me be serious. Let me be what I always wanted to be and what I really am, a writer. And I was very fortunate, actually. My, um, I, I, you know, I wrote and I won. Um, I didn't win a competition, but I put it forward for a really big competition on the TV in the UK. And out of 24,000 entries, um, my first book, which actually is still an unpublished book, it came top 10 in that competition. And so after that, publishers sort of knew who I was. And they said, well, we can't publish that book because it's, um, for various reasons, not commercial enough, too achingly sincere, too semi-autobiographical. The words I got were, um, you know, from all the good publishers. It was really kind of nice feedback. It's what we call in the trade rave rejections. What they said was, it breaks my heart. I can't publish this, but. And I went, no problem. I've written another book. And that one got published straight away. So I wrote four books with um, Macmillan, two with Headline. And then I thought, actually, there was one thing I did want to do that I never did, which was um, study medicine. I had four children, and it seemed too complicated. Well, I actually did get into medical school, but I, had, I was pregnant with twin, twin girls at that time. And I thought, you know what? When I published my sixth novel, someone said, six books? That's kind of a career, isn't it? And I went, you know what? I'll take a little break. And um, I've been in medical school now. I'll qualify um, as a doctor in three weeks' time when I do my finals. And, um, and it's fed, thank you. <laughs> and it's fed my writing as well, because I've got young children. My children range from um, nine to 13. I've got four of them. And I wanted to write something that would really make them aspire and achieve. So I'm writing a series about um, for young girls in medicine for Oxford University Press that's coming out next year. So I think that kind of shows that we can live many lives, and I think not all of them are predicated on our gender. Because yes, I am a mum, and I'm really proud of that, but I'm also a writer, I'm also a future doctor, I'm also a lecturer, I teach at Oxford part-time, and I think all of these things are important, and I think what we do in terms of our gender and those roles, that's very much, I guess, I hope, these days, still our decision. Thank you very much, uh, Rupert, and thank you for that point, actually, about you know, failing the first time in terms of not getting published yeah. with the first one, but not letting that daunt you, coming back with the second and um, pursuing it. Um, Maha, you're from Karachi, I think, originally, so would you yes. like to tell us a bit more? 
Yes, I was born and raised in Karachi, and uh, I moved to the UK to study at university and ended up settling there, but come, came back and forth a lot, spent a lot of time in Karachi. Um, so I ended up, I, 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 don't have, I didn't have the problems um, uh, that the other panelists had in terms of you know, families that, that expected um, statisticians or accountants. So I have a very artistic family. Most of my family are writers and artists and women who are just achieving tremendous things in that space. So I think when I said I wanted to write, it was sort of like, oh, but what about your boring brother who wants to be a banker? You know, so that was the problem in my family. Um, so I came to it late too, and in, in that I decided in my late 20s I was going to do a creative writing degree, and I wrote my first book off the back of that. Um, I have a day job as a financial journalist, so we could talk about finance and gender as well for hours and the problems there. Um, but I, I just thinking about this topic had two, um, two, uh, two memories sort of hit me that I thought would be worth mentioning. The first was when my first book came out, Beautiful from This Angle, which was now a long time ago, nine years ago. And um, I think people thought it was more salacious than it actually was or that I had intended it to be. But I remember one of the first interviews I did was with a journalist in Karachi, and he said to me, would you have written this book if you weren't married? And I said, what do you mean if I would have written this? Well, would you have written something like this if you weren't married? And I said, yes. Clearly, he never met my family. So um, I said, yes, I would. It's nothing to do with that. Um, and then years later, when The Curse of Mahanjadaro came out, um, I met a, a, a friend of a friend somewhere, and he said, I've heard you've written a thriller. I'm so excited. There are not that many thrillers in Pakistan. This is great. I'm going to read it. And he said, what's it about? And I said, well, it's takes set in modern time, but also in 3800 BC, and there's a woman who does this, and another woman who does, and his eyes glaze over, and he sort of said, oh, it's women's fiction. And he was clearly never gonna read it. Um, and I just, those two sort of, those two memories have stayed with me, because I think they sort of demonstrate some of the issues and challenges that you have in sort of these, these problems of def definitions and wanting to define things and wanting to, um, you know, put women in a certain kind of category in terms of writing. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and Alexandra, as the publisher on the, the panel here, and, and you've worked with uh, a phenomenal group of writers with, with, in your different publishing roles, now with Bloomsbury. Um, but would you like to say a little bit about uh, how you see the categorization and also about yourself and how you come to us today? Okay, so I was born in London. Um, my father was Scottish and um, but uh, very importantly for me, my mother came from a family of Moroccan Jews from Essaouira. Um, and uh, she made her life herself. She rejected her family. And when war broke out, she joined the ATS and became a driver. And she hated her father for not giving her an education. He made her leave school when she was 16. And at the end of the war, the British government paid for people to be educated, and she went to art school. And she discovered the life of, of bohemia, of, 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 of art and poetry. And she met my father. And she created a family in Chelsea um, on no money and made everything beautiful. She was a very dramatic woman who died just a few days ago. Oh. And, um, she gave me a sense that women can absolutely make their own lives and determine what they do. And in a way, she was the man in my household. She drove the car, she painted the walls, she made our clothes, she upholstered sofas, she went out to work, she was a teacher. Um, she, she was a, an extraordinary driving force. And so I had a lot to live up to. And I in fact, was an academic failure. So my parents gave me every advantage in education and um, I failed to match up, but I did find my own way. And um, I got myself an education of sorts and I went off to live in Italy for a year and then I came back and I knew that books were the most important thing in my life. And my very first job was an extraordinary thing because I got a job as what we called the office slave um, at Virago Press, the new, newly founded then feminist book publishing company in London. And I ended up um, editing a series called the Virago Modern Classics, which was rescuing forgotten and hidden voices of women. 
because male writers had consistently been kept in print, been taught in schools and universities, and women writers had been consigned to a pit of oblivion. So I spent the first 12 years of my working life rescuing women from that pit, and it was utterly defining in everything that I did. And I ended up some years later at Broomsby Publishing, and I think the two things that have guided me in my publishing world were in fact my gender, definitely. Um, and I have always published, I think, more women writers than male writers. I publish both, and they both matter to me a great deal. Um, one of whom is in fact um, uh, Carmela Shamsi, who I met when she was a student um, at university in upstate New York, and who I've worked with um, over all her career, and it's been a source of great pride to me. And the other thing that has mattered to me has been a word that's banded about a great deal now, but diversity in publishing voices from all over the world. And of course, I think both things in a way came from my mother. So as with all of us, so much comes from that in our lives. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And I'm so sorry to hear about your mother, but I, I, I am sure that she must have been so proud of what you've actually achieved in your life as well. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to ask the writers now um, a question. Um, in your books, you have female characters and you have male characters, and I wondered how you pre prepare for both and, and whether there are differences in your approach to that. Who would like to take that first? Rupa? Um, sure, I'll take it first. I was, um, when you just asked that, I was musing, because I think in my um, early books, I did have more of a focus on the female voice, and I wrote from a very close third. And um, it, it was a comfortable place for me to be, but once the books actually went out into the world, it became actually less comfortable because reviewers and critics and readers, they would look at the character I'd created, this you know, fictional creature I'd woven from many observations and memories in which I'd put many parts of many people and a little of myself, and they would somehow kind of conflate this character with myself. So particularly if I, I'm interested in difference and I'm interested in the things that, um, that cost us, the things that cut us and break us. And so I actually found that um, some parts of these kind of fragmented, interesting, flawed and fragile characters, people thought what well, belonged to me. And I found myself being quite judged um, academically and as a writer for being this sort of person, when in fact I was writing about these sorts of people. And that made me feel a little bit uncomfortable because in terms of the pure art, you think that as a writer, you should be quite separate from your characters and people shouldn't assume that this particular troubled bipolar character is yourself. I, I remember actually one time um, I went to um, my, my doctor, my dermatologist, and um, one of my characters in my books um, has severe eczema, so severe that she, um, she, it causes her anxiety and depression and eventually goes along that spectrum to self-harm. And my, uh, my doctor, my consultant, had read this book, and when she saw me, she went, oh my lord, Rupa, I had no idea your eczema had got that bad. We have to do something <laughs> about this. <laughs> and I thought, no, 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 that was a character in a book who's self-harming. I'm really not. So actually, that kind of made me a little bit nervous about writing female characters, because even though I really wanted to represent um, strong women in fiction, I actually found myself, when I wrote about people who'd been through a dark place and came out the other end, I found myself being looked at in a certain way. And so I found myself actually switching gender and actually writing about from the male voice because then I could pour everything, every sort of deep and dark and fractured moment into a male character and not be judged in the same way as the writer. And I'm unsure if I'd been a male writer if I would have felt that impetus to do that so much. And that, I guess, has consequences as well, because um, when I wrote this book, my, um, my sixth novel, The Good Children, I have four characters, two boys, two girls, who are beaten and browbeaten into being good children by um, a kind of dystopian fairy tale uh, mother who is uh, both a good witch and a bad witch. And the boys are the more fragile and the more broken and the more vulnerable characters. And I open and close with them and write about them from the first person. The girls are the strong characters who actually come through, who actually rebel. And they form the core of the novel. They're in the central chapters. And I was actually critiqued for that because they said I gave more attention to male characters and female in my book. And when the male ones were more interesting, because they had all these different things going on and because I chose the first person to write for them, so I was truly walking in the shoes of the male characters, but the girls were seen from the outside writing in the third. 
So I think, um, I think all of those things are quite interesting about how it's not just how we as a writer connect with our characters, that triangle between myself, the author, as the puppet master, if you like, of my characters here, but also how the reader takes that relationship, that they kind of close that triangle, both in terms of how they relate to the character and how they relate that character back to the, um, the author who created them. Thank you, Rupa. Uh, Leila, have you faced some of the same challenges that um, uh, yeah, if people do sort of assume that if that that, that you are the, the the person you're writing you're writing about, um, but what I find that when I write about m men, most of the time I'm basing it on a real person that I know, and I change, of course, the details so that they they'll never figure out who they are, mm -hmm. and it's not difficult to do that really because people will never accept that this is who they are. I mean, you see them in a way that they don't see themselves. So if you change a person's nationality and you change their occupation, they'll, they'll never guess it's them because this is how most people define themselves, you know, as with nationality and with, with their occupation. So they'll never, they'll never guess. So I tend to do that with, uh, with mostly with the men characters. I seem to need a, a concrete person to kind of peg it on. Whereas with the women, um, they, they kind of come evolve organically, and I don't have to worry so much about them, um, and to think, you know, uh, you know, who I'm basing them on, and and, and something like that. They just they, they seem to uh, evolve kind of more uh, more, more naturally, um, because I, of course, it's to do with life experience. I mean, men are are, are men largely because of the, 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 their experience and women are women because of their experience. And so because I haven't gone through the experience uh, of, of being a, a, a man, it's, it, it would be difficult for me maybe to write a scene where a man is walking down the street or something like that. It might be d d difficult maybe for me. And of course a lot of my scenes are, are indoors. There's a lot of domestic uh, sort of indoor uh, scenes. Um, so, you know, once I'm moving away from that, I just have to work a little bit harder. But that comes with time. I mean, I can tell that from my, my very first book, you know, I can, uh, you start as a writer to feel more confident and you can take more risks and you can <coughs> deliberately, you know, challenge yourself to write about things that, that you personally haven't experienced or, uh, and also to, to rely more on research. So I tend to research now more than I did at the beginning of, of, of my career. I do tend to read. Um, and also, uh, research doesn't have to be uh, factual research. It could also be other novels. So sometimes if I would read other novels uh, on that theme or similar, and, and that, would, that helps me to get my imagination going, yeah. Thank, thank you. And, and Maha, you've got a background in finance and economics, and you talk about women's financial empowerment being important, whether that's in Pakistan or, or elsewhere. To what extent are you yourself part of that in your characters? How do you bring yourself into them? Empowerment or financial empowerment? Well, I think particularly financial empowerment, because that's, we talk about empowerment generally, and that's full of all sorts of things. But I think far too many of us actually try and, try and put financial empowerment somewhere else, because it's hard. It's, you know, it's difficult. We don't really want to face those brown envelopes. So, <laughs> Well, it's interesting because my last book, as I said, was set in 3800 BC in part. And a question that a journalist asked me was, why is there so much economics in here? <laughs> and I was like, um, And it was, for me, what was interesting is that they had this kind of barter system and this really interesting way of trading and um, measuring cubes and working out what things were, were, were worth and value. And I brought that in. And, 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 and um, did it because I think it adds a level of authenticity to see that this is how things worked back then. And, um, and women were very much at the forefront of that. Women, um, certainly in this society, as far as we know, uh, it was a matriarchal society to a certain degree. So I, I guess it does inform my work a little bit. It certainly means that I'm empowered myself to talk about these issues, which, um, which which I think we all need to understand more than we do. And I think in terms of finance, it's very, very um, dangerous that finance has a language of its own. And I think it's a language of obscurity. So you walk in a room with a bunch of traders, and probably only 10% of the financial industry themselves will understand what the traders are talking about. I mean, there's slang and whatever. And I, I, I don't think that's empowering. I think 
that needs to change, um, and it needs to become more accessible, not just to women, but to communities and societies as a whole. Um, in terms of um, characters and writing about men, um, I haven't done it yet because I found it so hard, so I think I have to learn from you. Um, I had a children's book that had two boys in it, but they were based on my nephews, so it was <laughs> fine. And I had the same experience that you did, which is my first novel was, um, you know, had a, quite a bit of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I don't want to relive the experience of what happened afterwards because everyone thought that I was every single character in the book. <laughs> and, and I really wasn't because I'm really boring and I go to bed early. And, <laughs> And there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and I, Alexandra, if I could move us to another question. Um, uh, something more than a year ago, the hashtag MeToo campaign uh, and some, some uh, very affecting testimony came out, both from women and, and from men, um, as a result of that. And you could call it a kind of categorization. But I wondered if you'd seen any changes in writing and publishing since that uh, campaign arose, uh, or whether there are changes you would like to see as a result of that? Um, I think that um, there have been, in both good and bad ways, I think there is a, a slightly depressing way in which publishers are always looking for the next thing, and, um, and so everybody dashes after it. And um, I have to say that as somebody who's been in the publishing world for a very long time and was in the vanguard of feminist publishing all those years ago in the 70s, I do rather think, so darling, where are we now? You know, have we not been doing this for a very long time? Um, the, the Me Too movement is a, a sort of seismic shift that we're going through all over the world and an incredibly important one. Um, but there are aspects of it, I mean, most of it is essential and urgent and important, but there are also aspects of it that worry me slightly, um, and partly because I think the feminist movement of the 1970s was very much about women taking responsibility for themselves, and um, I feel anxious about women categorizing themselves as victims, and using that as a, as a way of, of portraying where they are. And I think we have to move beyond that, and I'm very concerned that we do, and we do that in, in our publishing and in our lives as well. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all shakes down. In the publishing world, I think the signal thing that happened is that a young woman wrote a story called Cat Person, which many of you will have read. It, it was published in the New Yorker and it went absolutely viral. A very talented, new voice in the, in the, in the world of literature, but that's what it was. This was not a world-changing story, but it became seen as such. And the book that came out of that was sold for seven figures in America and six figures in the UK. Utterly deranging, insane thing to happen. And then the book was published recently. And of course, what happened? The press descended on it and said, this is not great art, this is not great literature. The author would never have said that that was what she was, but this is what the media and the world made of it. And, and I worry about this. I think that, you know, we, we all need to act responsibly, including publishers and the press. Thank you. No, certainly the, the new power of social media to, to take an idea like that and extend it worldwide to, to an extent and how that fits with our perhaps received wisdom on, on standards of literature and writing. Mm -hmm. um, would any of you like to say anything more about the, the Me Too campaign and mm -hmm. your thoughts? I think I'd, I'd quite like to respond to both of the... Um, mm -hmm. I think they're connected, um, what happened post Me Too and the economic question very much. I think um, any difference, actually, in terms of um, gender inequality, I think you have to address the economic inequality as well. Um, I, I actually um, wrote about feminist theory when, in my undergrad, and it's something that still interests me very much. And what I think it was Andrea Dworkins who said that actually, let's be serious, in no part of the world, in no society, has a woman actually ever been yet economically equivalent to a man. And I think that is something that, um, even though it happens in small pockets and we feel that we should have moved beyond it, actually when I look back and when I see what's been ha what happened, I think a lot of the inequality, a lot of the victimization from Me Too happens from power roles, and that is actually predicated on the economics, on the more powerful person being able, because they have the economic 
power, because they are the boss, because they are the person in that position, to actually impose themselves in a way on a, you know, on a woman in their employ, for example, which is less appropriate. And I think that um, that is something that's incredibly important and something that we have to address. I mean, as female writers, we are incredibly fortunate because we have wonderful publishers like Alexandra. We have um, a, an industry which is actually run, which is very equal, if not um, dominated by excellent women. But at the same time, we put our books out in the world and we are trying to reach a wider audience and reach, and we are not just trying to preach the converted. And even though we are fortunate as women writers to actually have great advocates, uh, publishers like Alexandra and great editors and great agents, we also want our books to be read and we also want our books to be perceived at the same level as our male counterparts. And I think the reason why it is, um, you know, there still needs to be the question, we still need to define ourselves sometimes as a woman writer rather than a writer, is because by only acknowledging that there is a difference, can you hope eventually to erase it? No, thank you. I agree. And Alexandra? I, I completely agree with you, and I think that one of the problems is the literary establishment is still largely male. I would also say that in publishing companies, if you look at the right at the top, that the, the ownership and, and the stewardship of them is, is, is mm. still largely male. So, okay. the, yeah, the, the, the economic inequality continues, yeah. um, and uh, we, we, you know, it's, it's the world that, that we're in. Um, I, I, of course, the, the Women's Prize was set up to try and counteract that, um, and, and what I think is so fascinating is that when it comes to fiction, it is women who um, buy fiction, something extraordinary like 60 to 80% women, they give it to men, um, and, but yet it is men that judge it uh, in literary terms. Thank you for raising the um, categorization of book awards, because I think there are more and more book awards uh, internationally these days, but they've all got a category associated with them. And sometimes, I mean, there can be good reasons for that in terms of, of not trying to choose from everything all the time, but it can sometimes also put a writer into a category. And I wondered if some of you, some of you have been long-listed, short-listed, have won, um, but whether or not that experience, how do you feel about book awards and whether your book and your name is put forward for something that has a clear category on it, a clear label? Leila. Um, I think as a writer, you're just happy to, for, you know, to get any kind of recognition. Um, and I don't, I don't feel strongly about it. I mean, I don't mind that I'm labeled this or that or uh, it's not something that I feel, you know, particularly strongly about. Um, I think that the, the, the books kind of like speak, should speak for themselves rather than, than what the, 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 the labeling is. Um, I don't in my day-to-day -day life meet a lot of writers because I live in Aberdeen and it's kind of remote. So, uh, so for me to, uh, it's only in events like this where I get to meet other writers and then I, uh, people, and then I have conversations about, about writing. But, and even my closest friends don't, uh, don't actually read and uh, some of them don't read my books either. So, <laughs> so I'm quite okay with that. So I kind of live in a world where, where you know, all these things don't matter so much. So, um, uh, so that's why it doesn't affect me on a, on a, on a, on a kind of day-to-day -day life. The thing is, when you're writing, um, you're, you want your published, you want to please your publisher so much. And the, the worst thing is when the publisher is disappointed in you and your in your sales, and then they don't want to publish you anymore. So, so that's the thing that's 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 keeping you. That, you know, you, that's, that's all, the, all what it's about at the end of the day, is that if you, if you, if you know, and so if the prize helps that, mm -hmm. and if the prize mm -hmm. makes the publisher happy, then, uh, then, you know, you have to go along with that. No, the recognition is important, Very that, important. however it, it comes. Maha, how would you like to see the award system go on in the future? Do, do you think it's valuable, necessary? Um, I'm, I'm actually thinking about Kamla Shamsi couple of years ago or last three year. years ago last year yeah. calling for a year of women's publishing was that last year mm -hmm. yeah and, two and years ago two years ago yeah. and I think only one publisher took her up on mm -hmm. that is that true uh, I think um, I mean I think we have the women's prize which is a fantastic fantastic uh, 
uh, prize, and Kamla won it this year. I'm so happy about that, or last year. Um, but I think um, these kind of conversations need to happen more. I mean, we've got the Booker, the man Booker, and you know, there's a lot of um, there's still a mismatch of, of, in representation on that, from what I personally understand. Um, I wish uh, publishers published more women and took that uh, more seriously. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And if, if I could just add to that, I, I've, I know Kate, who actually um, started up the Women's Prize, or the Orange Prize, as it was in its first iteration. And um, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that prize. I mean, I've been very fortunate in, in my career. I've published six books. I've got nominations and listings. But when my very first book came out, um, it was um, judged and dismissed based on the, the pretty Paisley cover and my smiley author photo at the back. And I remember um, there was one reviewer who said, I'm so, I mean, forgive me for, this, uh, mis for quoting, but he said something like, I'm so tired of attractive Asian authors writing about themselves. And oh. that was what he said about my book. And it sold 800 copies before it got nominated for the Women's Prize. And then it went on to get great reviews and it sold 30,000 and it established my career. But if I was to wait for the establishment to have recognized my work without something like a prize saying, actually, this is a really good book, you know, don't judge it because of, you know, the author's photograph or what you think this sort of author from this sort of background might be writing, read it. And that's what that did for me. And so I would never complain about the categorization because it actually gave me an opportunity to reach that audience. And I very much doubt if I hadn't had that, um, I very much doubt my publisher would have kept me on for my second book or my third or my fourth based on those 800 copies that I sold before I got that nomination. But don't you it, think it was completely the... astonishing how when the Women's Prize was set up, uh, the world went mad and uh, nobody had ever complained about prizes for Scottish writers or Welsh mm -hmm. writers or writers who published their first novel over the age of 40 or 60. There are so many prizes with categories <laughs> and they've never been complaints but when women dare set up a prize um, people went insane. It was extraordinary. What is so lovely about the Women's Prize is that along with the Booker, it's the only prize where people will read the shortlist as well yeah. as the winner. That it, it, people really trust the prize to the intelligence of the writing, the range of it, and, and the quality of it. And I, I think that's a real testament to that prize. Yeah. Certainly, thank you. Leila, you were going to say something. No, I was going to say that uh, you distinguish between the establishment and then the prize, but then the prize can become an establishment in itself, and we can get to a situation where, uh, you know, the prize becomes extremely powerful, and 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 so we're all dependent on on the on the prize, for example. And uh, if 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 you're the sort of writer which prizes don't like for whatever reason, then then uh, then uh, you, you, you know your career wouldn't wouldn't go on. So I think that could become problematic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe after some after some time, mm -hmm. when a prize becomes mm -hmm. very very popular. Yeah, prize. I agree. And I think um, I think what that prize did in the it was that it was very open. It was um, the Booker. I don't, most people don't know this, but you can't just write a good book and get nominated for the Booker. Your publisher picks two books that year from its entire list and puts them forward. Mm -hmm. And I remember that year it was. Sebast when I was there, it was Sebastian Folks and another big male writer. Um, who was it? It was um, Benjamin Black. And, you know, they got put forward. They were never going to put me forward. I would never have had a chance of being put on any list. The Women's Prize, or the Orange Prize it was then, would take any book written by a woman and published they in Britain. They don't, I'm afraid. Oh, right, back, no. back then they did. No, yeah. you still only had, you had three. Three. Oh, okay. I'm afraid it's heartbreaking. Oh, Putting okay. in prize submissions is the most heartbreaking bit of the year. You know, there are some prizes, right. the Costa Prize you can put in as many right. as you like, but both the women's and the, and, and the Booker um, are restricted. Yeah. No, yeah. so yeah, no, I agree with Leila then and yourself that it is, it's, you yeah. know, right. it does become an issue if it mm. does restrict in that mm. way. But that's why for, I think prizes are a great thing to get to work yeah. forward. Can I just I move us on though, perhaps more broadly and ask whether as a writer or as a publisher and thinking of your experience with Virago, Alexandra as well, um, do you feel a personal responsibility to speak up for women? And should you? As a publisher, yes, I do. Yeah, and I have done all my career. Um, I think, in a way, it's what I was put on this earth to do. Um, I, also, you know, I feel that my responsibility is to find the best voices and to, to publish the best writing that I can. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, 
I, it must be connected, I think, to, to the, my years at Virago. And we, were, we set out to change the world, and I hope we did at least a bit. I, yeah, I mean, um, me too. I, I, I um, don't write literary fiction, but um, in my fiction, I think my, my thriller was called a feminist thriller. <laughs> and, um, I, I just haven't been able to get away from it, actually. I think it's the thing that I think about a lot. Um, and as I said, I haven't written about men yet. And um, just a, a personal anecdote, I mean, even as a financial journalist in publishing, I have a, a magazine that I edit. I had um, men on the cover many, many times, and no one's ever complained. I had four women in a row, and I had more complaints after that than I've ever had <laughs> before and after. So I, I feel these things are really important. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I, it does feel like something of a, of a responsibility, and it's also a huge pleasure. But, you know, I always mentor um, black and Asian women um, mm. writers as my students in Oxford and um, in my role with the Royal Literary Fellowship. So I seek those writers actively because I know what a minefield it is to be, you know, both a woman and a diverse, a diverse, diverse woman writing in Britain. And I always put those characters in my books because I think that, you know, I should be representing ourselves in some way. Before we move to, to having some questions from the audience, um, so we'll move there shortly, can I just ask you, those of you um, perhaps writing uh, and, and looking at the role of women in Asian and African societies, is there a difference? Do you feel there's categorization there that it's taking us or, or will take us a lot longer to move on from? We're, we're surprised at, for example, you know, two days ago, I met one of Pakistan's young women aerospace engineers who runs her own company, very impressive character. Um, but we don't hear about that kind of woman very much and they don't fit the categorization that seems to be there. D does that matter and is that changing? Leila? Um, yes, I think that that is, the, that is uh, changing. Um, um, it's different if you're writing about, of course, women within uh, in, in Asia or in Africa, or if you're writing about immigrant women, for, for example, there's, there's, a, there's a big uh, difference about, about that. Um, I think one of the questions that comes up when, when I do events is this idea of the Western gaze. You know, I'm often asked about that, you know, that, that uh, um, people kind of like are kind of caught wondering about this, do you know how you're writing, if you're writing for a Western audience or you're writing for a Western publisher, then are you pandering to their stereotypes? Are, they giving, give, are you giving them what they want to, to hear? And that, that is, is a matter of, of, of great concern, of course, which is why it's very important that for, for me personally, and I think for, for, for other writers like myself, that we do get feedback from, you know, writers who are like, from readers who are like ourselves, you know, um, who have the same cultural background as, as ourselves, and critics who have the same cultural background as ourselves, prizes also that are, you know, uh, you know specifically where we're, our work is judged against other, you know, um, uh, African writers or, or Asian writers. So I think that that is important because in, when that happens then, then we are, we are freed from this, you know, burden of, 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 of being, um, you know, um, judged according to, to the, mm. we're writing for, for, mm. for the West in a way. Yeah. Rupa Maha. Mm. I'm just thinking about the fact that there was one time that I went to a bookstore and there, there was a sort of section and there were South Asian writers in it. And there were three women writers, all very well known, um, remarkable writers. And I noticed that three of their covers were sort of dusty pink and they all had henna <laughs> hands on them. And, um, and there was one that had a sort of spice market in the back. And I mean, you don't ask female writers from Britain to sort of have scones and tea and, you know, cream <laughs> on their covers. So, so I think it's problematic, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we're talking about um, wider societies. And I think that, um, yes, it, it is changing, but slowly. And I think one of the issues in many societies, and it brings us back to the economic argument, is that the fact of motherhood involves um, an economic dependence of necessity in, for a certain part of a woman's life, which is a hurdle in terms of her work and her you know, artistic work and in getting funding and so on, that it is something that society hasn't yet dealt with. Um, the, um, the inequality isn't, based, isn't actually predicated on our biology, it's on how it's been set up around us. And I think if there's a little bit more thought into that, then actually that shouldn't be, um, become a burden. You shouldn't have to 
create and work as though you don't have children and then mother as though you don't create and work. You should be able to bring these together. I mean, I know that being a mother has absolutely enriched all my writing. I wouldn't have been able to write or create the characters that I've done if I hadn't been a parent. So I think each aspect of our life is important. Yes. No, I think we could have a whole other panel in terms of illustration and book covers in terms of what <laughs> it makes people think about, you know, whether they pick it off the shelf or not. Um, on there and that responsibility of the illustrator, male or female. Um, can we open up to some questions from the audience, please? Um, lady up at the top there. Assalamu alaikum. I am Sabai Idris. And my question is, what are the problems that you face as women writers when you create male characters? Because um, Marianne Evans was um, recognized for being a female writer uh, because of her character of Maggie and uh, somebody, I, don't, I forgot who, said that this could not have been uh, created by a male writer because the details that went into her uh, characterization were too deep to be written by a male writer. Thank you. We'll take another question, the gentleman here, and then we'll ask you to, some of you to come back. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, there are points moving here and there in my, in my mind, but let me put it in a coherent way. Like whatever we are discussing, somehow uh, you people are just trying to challenge this women past categorization, and somehow this is something that you are reflecting through th through your writings too. And what what I think that like the way you can be um, the way you people have been doing it, you know, by by highlighting the nuances of women's lives. What I want to ask about from a very academic perspective that when, when, you, try, when, when you talk about this uh, women discourse and when you write, so do you, do you highlight um, like the strict identity of malehood that men have in a patriarchal system? Somehow, do, do, do you shed light on that or do you think, that, and one other thing, one other question that I want to ask that how important do you consider that when you try to talk about the nuances of a women's life, what kind of problems that they have been facing, or when you are, when you are adding to this feminist discourse, to what extent do you believe in this thing that uh, the kind of uh, strict uh, patriarch, the kind of a strict malehood identity that has been assigned to males in a patriarchal system, that should be highlighted in your discourse, and in this way you, you, you need to engage the male's parts too in this feminist discourse somehow, to make it more and more inclusive instead of you know putting it in this way in front of males that it's a kind of a very women centric type of a thing and you know that is t totally against them i hope i have conveyed the no, message no that that's fine i think we've got a couple of points there interestingly about writing about men in a sense and how that comes in and one more question yeah go ahead You know, it's basically a, around almost reverse discrimination or reverse prejudice or reverse uh, categorization. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm all for, obviously, I'm, I, it, this is coming from a personal standpoint, basically that um, when, the, and there's fluidity in these uh, items that I believe there's feminine forces, there's masculine forces, and everybody has that in terms of their relationships and their identity and their sexuality. They're, you know, so the fluidity aspect, I think, sometimes gets eclipsed when there's broad categorizations. And in that way, um, the men who are actually recognizing that there is an imbalance when a woman is not empowered, such as me, um, would like to obviously be supportive in bringing that balance back into the picture, but sometimes when, when there's a patriarchal society and th then there's a Me Too movement, it's almost like sometimes there's a backlash to the men who are almost trying to help. And um, so the, the point being that, and it, because also in a patriarchal society, women almost get confused about their own sexual identity because they don't, they're not able to express it. Okay, they're I think we've got kind of, there's a theme there in those, those three questions. Who would like to start with some response? 
Rupa. Um, okay. <laughs> um, okay, quite a few questions to um, answer there. Um, with regard to the, the writing of the, um, the male character, I actually, you know, I, I find it, you know, people are surprised that we can write as a male character, but you can equally write as someone who is completely of the other. I mean, I have no experience of being a man. I have met in my life. I have no experience of writing as a very elderly, disabled person. I can understand, I can empathize what it is to walk in those shoes. I have no personal experience of autism. My entire, one of my entire novels was based on um, an autistic girl, and I did a lot of research, and I try to imagine the world through non-neurotypical eyes. So it is um, an imaginative leap of faith you make when you write in the heart of any character. And I think gender is only one of the things that describes us. And so that is, so I don't find it hard in that respect because it is what you have to do to understand any other character. And we have so many different facets to ourselves. With regard to the is there this us and them, should we be um, also considering that they are um, the male characters as well? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what I was trying to do in my last novel when I had these two male characters, two female characters, four children um, who were all, um, I guess, party and subject to the same sense of suppression and they were both they were equally put into different categories the boys were said you shall go abroad you shall be separated from your home and your loved ones you shall go and be study and become doctors you shall study and you shall study harder and that is your role and the girls even though they were incredibly intelligent and had ambition they said you can study you can do that but you will be dutiful wives and when you're married do as you please a married woman will do as her will do as she pleases and this was you know set in sort of the 50s and 60s so each of them um, each the girls and the boys were each pushed into roles that were not absolutely comfortable for them because of this kind of overstraining societal pressure and tradition. So I agree that it is not an us and them. We have to understand that. And I guess that leads into your point. Yes, you have to be aware, you know, not everyone is the enemy. You know, not everyone is trying to say, yes, let's try and keep women in that position because that keeps us in a slightly better position. And equally, um, women who have reached a certain position should not be tugging up that ladder behind them and saying, well, I'm here, I'm fine. Um, Margaret Thatcher in the um, 80s famously had an all-male cabinet. They should actually be thinking about what can I do to make sure that these opportunities are available to everyone else. And actually, but that's why I actually don't have an issue with categorization. One of my um, colleagues feels very strongly that they should, we shouldn't be described as female writers or Asian writers, just as writers. I completely understand where that comes from, but I also think that if we are just writers, the truth is we are lost in the reviews, in the bookshops. We don't necessarily get our place on the program because we are considered, we are kind of overlooked in many ways. But I think if you just recognize that categorization to begin with, that, there, that it exists, that there are female writers, that there are Asian writers, and sometimes we are not seen or heard as loudly as we could, then we can do away with that, categor with that categorization when there is more equality, I guess, and it's based on the quality of what we write rather than who has actually produced that work. Alexandra, can I ask you whether these issues come up when you talk with your writers in, in terms of the works that they're preparing? Um, I, I think that they do most of all with writers who are going beyond their gender and beyond their situation. I work with a, an exceptional writer called Georgina Harding, and all her novels are about men and trauma. And her most recent novel, Land of the Living, it actually opens in India, in Nagaland, um, during the Second World War, and um, her central voice is, is this man who who suffers huge trauma and witnesses a massacre and has to go back to a marriage that doesn't exist and he carries the war with him. And she writes about the impossibility of um, this man's life as a result of what he's been through. But all her novels have been around these themes. And she complains that her name is Georgina. It's a very feminine name. And um, she gets fabulous reviews, but um, she doesn't get the kind of adulation that, for example, a writer like Colm Tobin did when he wrote about a young Irish woman. Um, people are full of adulation when a man has a female character and does it successfully, but it doesn't really translate the other way around. And Georgina, very interestingly, did an event at a literary festival with the great war photographer Don McCullen and the 
um, journalist who, who lost three limbs, uh, Giles Dooley, in Afghanistan. And so there were two men who had seen war and this woman. And um, I was very proud that she was, she was there. But it's a real struggle to get people to, to read her as without a gender, in a sense. Um, and, and that's where I find the most difficult side of it is. Thank you. We've been given our five-minute warning. So are there two quick, short questions from the audience? If not, I'm going to ask one. No hands. OK, I'm going to ask the last question then for each of you. And this is uh, where and when do you write or read? Uh, and are you a lark or an owl? Uh, is it a shed in the garden or, or whatever? Um, who would like to start? Leila, where and when? Uh, in, in the morning at, at, at home. Yeah. And actually, the first thing in the morning is a very good uh, time to write. I do recommend that, yes. In Aberdeen? Um, in Aberdeen, yes, where, where, where I live, yeah, in, uh, in, in Aberdeen. And uh, of course, when I had young children, I couldn't do the early morning slot. I had to take them to, sc to school first. But now I can you know, get up and, and write before anything else. And that's, I found that's very good uh, advice, actually. And even in terms of word count, I counted the number of words I could produce first thing in the morning compared to the number of words I could produce in the afternoon. And I do more in the morning. Yeah. That sounds remarkable discipline. <laughs> Rupa, what do you do? Um, yeah, no, again, first thing in the morning. Um, before I started med school, I just get up at 5 and write till 7, get my 500 words in the bank before I had to to take over the kids and take them to school and go to work and so on. So I always felt really good that I'd done what I needed to do as a writer that day. And um, since starting med school, I, I have a long train journey, so I do it on my